Ken's speaking for Ken. And uh, we know enough about Ken to know we really want to hear what he's got to say because he's not afraid to say his version of the truth. Okay? So uh, what we're trying to do here is we've got a YouTube channel, 911TVORG, run by Humuk. Humuk, H-U-M-M-U-X is how you spell it, but it's pronounced Humuk. We're doing a live stream. We've got about a dozen people there. Hopefully we'll have more. We had a Facebook page where we kept adding entries and uh, got the most feedback we've ever had on our Facebook page from this event. And I mean from people all over the world. So uh, thanks to you who came from a distance. I know some of you uh, came a ways to be here today with us. Anyway, you know Ken's history. I won't go into that. If you want to check that out, we've already published it. We're not waiting anymore. We're bringing up Ken O'Keefe. Please welcome to the house. You know, this, uh, if there's anything that I script, I suppose, is that I, I never script anything. I always say that, but uh, I always uh, speak straight from the heart. And I have to say, Berkeley's brought out the uh, desire to discuss some of the taboo issues that uh, you would have thought in liberal left circles that uh, we, we'd be openly discussing. Um, but it's funny how the uh, world is. It seems like everything is upside down, quite frankly. But before I do that, let me just say this. This tour is totally last minute. I mean, normally if you're going to plan a tour around the country, uh, or anywhere in the world for that matter, usually you'd have a bit of a lead up time and you know people would be organizing in the places that you're visiting. This was only decided uh, like uh, 10 days ago or something. 10 days ago was the commitment to do it and boom, ticket was bought and itinerary scheduled. So thank you all to everybody uh, who's here. It's, it's wonderful to, to see people uh, coming out. It's not easy to get people out to events for political stuff. There's so much going on and uh, in general it's a real task to get people. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you to Vic, big time. Um, he's done a lot of work. He's reached out. He's secured the event. It, it's not been stopped, and I can't, I'm, I'm disappointed, damn it. Where's the freaking, where's my enemies, like, coming to, like, protest and shit? There's none of them here. Is any of you planted, like, getting ready to make a move at some point? Come on, man, seriously? It makes for such fun. Anyway, I don't know why, but they just don't come after me, like, like you would think they would, but, uh, uh, you know, let me just say first off that the, the, the reason why I do what I do is I've managed through my own process to recapture the ability to think for myself, and that's like the first thing they strip from us, by the way, I mean literally, that's like they strip that shit right away, and they basically get us to regurgitate a bunch of trivial pursuit questions on command, and if you do that really well enough, then you get to go to university and then you, you, know, you get to regurgitate slightly more complex trivial pursuit questions, and if you do that on command well enough and you jump through this hoop and do that backflip and so on and so forth, then you get the job, you make the money, and then you live the so-called American dream. And, um, and the way I see it is it's pretty much all programming. I mean, there are some amazing independent thinkers out there who are in positions of you know, high academia and, and even in politics to some degree. And, uh, but it, for the most part, you know, what we do is we, we play the game and we get rewarded for playing the game. And I could have easily been one of those guys who did that. I was in the Marine Corps, but something happened to me that traumatized me, quite frankly. And all of the programming just, bam, was just shattered in one fell swoop. You know, in this case, it was the Marine Corps. I believe, you know, you, everybody's seen the Marine Corps commercials, honor and integrity and you know, leadership by example. It's all very impressive. I mean, the branding and the marketing is top notch. And, you know, I believe that stuff. And, you know, saying the Pledge of Allegiance every day, you know, with liberty and justice for all, for Christ's sake, and there's no truth to that at all, but you say it every day, and it becomes a reality. And this is the American experience, you know, and I grew up in Southern California. We grow up believing that we're the greatest nation in the world, and the idea that we aren't the greatest, quote, greatest, greatest is, is like really, really uh, foreign to us. You know, the idea that there might be even more freedom elsewhere, 
uh, or that there might be more democracy elsewhere, or there, there might be more virtue or integrity or honor or courage or anything like that is, is like foreign to us. We believe that we are like the epitome of all of these virtuous things and no nation can even come close. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago for, for a guy like me to say the kinds of things I'm saying now, it was totally outrageous, completely outrageous. It's turned a lot, you know, especially, you know, America bashing has become quite popular. So the market has changed and, you know, the things that I'm saying, uh, they have an audience. Living in Europe, I, I, I see an incredible hypocrisy there as well, though. The Europeans think they're like so much more superior and they know so much more about geo. And they're just as stupid as, as the American population on most levels, really. But they think, you know, so far up their own ass that they believe that they're all, you know, so much higher and, and whatnot. But the truth of the matter is that very few of us actually have the ability to think for ourselves. And there's different ways to, to get that back if, if you've been stripped of it. And I don't care what anybody says, there's a lot of programming in, in most of us. And very few of us have the ability to actually shed that stuff and start really thinking for ourselves. But when you do, boy, oh boy, does it revolutionize the, the way you see the world. And, you know, it, it, it's a normal process for most of us when we start actually seeing things as they are to feel very alone, you know, very isolated. Many people get depressed, you know, they, they look at the masses who, you know, are you kidding me? Do people actually believe this nonsense? And it, it all seems very depressing, but I don't know. I, I managed to stumble on some things that really helped me along the way. And, and one of them was the understanding that we, we are all, all of us, not just human beings, but all life. We are all brothers and sisters in a family of life. We all have a common fate. We live on planet Earth. You know, what's good for the Earth is good for us. What's bad for the Earth is bad for us. There's just no way to break that, you know. I mean, you may profit financially from doing something bad for the Earth, but have you really gained? Well, the only way that you could possibly have gained is if you believe that you live uh, detached, disconnected from the rest, and that somehow you can derive benefit at someone else's expense. When you understand the truth, from my perspective, understanding that we are all connected, what is good for you is good for me. And there's no way around that. I don't care how clever you are. In truth, your cleverness is your stupidity. You think that you can manage to obtain some real benefit off of exploiting somebody else's weakness. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And I don't care how smart you are. The fact is that if you have harmed others for your own perceived personal benefit, you have screwed yourself and you have not helped the planet or the greater good. And, and we've been conned into this, especially, you know, I know Southern California particularly well. I mean, I was born not far from here in Napa, but I was, uh, you know, transplanted to Southern California, and that's where I grew up. And I remember from a young age just how strange it all was, you know. There was just this kind of strange... Uh, you know, what, what is really going on? I remember like being a surfer. I love surfing, you know, like really love surfing. And yet the surfing click was like, what, you know, they, I remember when they all stayed, started saying bra, bra, hey bra, like we're black or something, you know, we're a bunch of white middle class kids living in suburbia and all of a sudden we're talking like we're black and everyone started saying, you know, bra, bra, this, that and the other and I just I didn't understand this, like why? Is this just all part of the programming? I, I never understood. And I remember having vans. I just got a new pair of vans from my lady, a very lovely pair of vans, going back to my days as a teenager in uh, San Diego and whatnot. When I was a kid, I had a pair of vans, and they, were, uh, they had the checkers. Remember those? They had the checkers uh, down in this part. And um, nobody had those. So when I went to school with those for the first time, there were kids that looked at this, but hey, what's that? You know, they go, what the hell is that? Why are you wearing that? And, you know, they, and I just thought, what the fuck is going on here? You know, I like them. What's, you know, is this not approved or something? Is there some fucking committee or something that's supposed to approve shit before you start wearing it? And, you know, it never made any sense to me. And, and you know, from a young age, I endured these types of things and, and got into fights over this kind of stuff too. Like if you want to keep giving me shit over like what I'm wearing or whatever nonsense it is that you're you know, thinking is wrong, um, I, don't, I don't like people intimidating. 
me. I, I don't like bullies. I've never liked bullies. And, you know, when people try and, you know, tell me what you're supposed to do, and I know it's not right, and, you know, it's conformity and bowing to whatever it is. It's governments. It doesn't matter. Police. I don't like any of it. You know, all I really want is to be a free man. You know, I wish no harm, no foul to anybody. I won't harm or foul anybody. Unless, of course, they want to threaten me, and, and then I'll do whatever I need to to protect my own interests. But aside from that, I honestly want what's best for everybody. And, you know, I say that, and, and I suppose that's probably the good segue into some of the more controversial things, the things that we're not supposed to be able to talk about, which to me is a, a big red flag to say, that's what you're supposed to talk about, these things that we're not allowed to talk about. You know, I don't know the quote uh, word for word, but I'm sure many of you know it, Voltaire, you know, you want to know where the power is, find out who you can't criticize. Well, if there's one group on this planet that you really can't criticize, um, it's pretty damn obvious. I'm sure everybody's just waiting for that <laughs> word to come out. <laughs> you know, but before I even say the word and start getting into this subject, I'm going to repeat again, and I'll repeat as many times as is necessary, everybody on this planet including non-humans for that matter, but certainly my human brothers and sisters are in fact brothers and sisters. And I actually want what's best for all of my brothers and sisters. And I see two populations on this planet who are being set up for a major, major fall. Major, major fall. The parallels I see between these two groups could hardly be any more obvious in my opinion. And that is the Jewish people and the American people. And I'll tell you the two things that I see in common with them. The first thing is that both populations have derived a benefit by their complicity. Both of us, both populations. And a lot of Americans don't like to hear me talk about responsibility, especially if they feel like they're part of the, you know, dissenting voice and they've gone to the protests and signed the petitions and voted for the anti-war guy and all this sort of stuff. Then they feel like, you know, hey, don't call me responsible, man. I'm not responsible for that shit. You know, and they don't like that. They don't like, you know, like the idea that they would have anything to do with what's wrong. You know, of course, I can get into taxes and all sorts of things and all the different things that we're doing that is direct complicity. And we are, myself included. I'm responsible for this mess as well. You know, I mean, I'm doing what I can, but there are things that I do that are contradictory. At least I'm willing to admit the contradictory things that I'm involved in. I try and reduce the contradictions and the hypocrisy as best I can, but the bottom line is the Jewish people and the American people have benefited profoundly from a twisted, perverse, corrupt, fraudulent system which has imparted more value to our currencies effectively and diminished the value of other people's currencies and, and relegated much of the planet to a state of poverty that most of us couldn't even imagine while we've been sitting here relatively high on the hog and enjoying the benefits of this perverse, twisted, unjust system. And we both have this in common. The other thing we have in common is we're both supremacists. And this is a, you know, I don't, American exceptionalism, that's fucking supremacism. You believe you're better than everyone else. It's like a disease, you know. We look at the, especially with the official version of World War II, Nazi Germany, you know, the Nazis are seen as supremacists. And it's just obvious how wrong that is. And yet, here we are in America thinking we're the greatest in the world, certainly, especially, I mean, more and more people have been questioning that. And I have to give out a plug to George Bush, man. He was the fucking best, man. Nobody woke up more people than George Bush, I'm telling you. I'm talking junior. That guy rose the consciousness of humanity more than anyone else you can name. And if you can name somebody you think woke up more people than George Bush, go ahead and present it to me. That guy woke up a lot of people. Obama put him back to sleep. Oh yeah, we are the greatest. Look, black president, He's, look at that man. We're such an open and tolerant and loving and democratic society. We are supremacists. We believe we're better. And so we can excuse ourselves for the mistakes we make by justifying it in the context of we're better still, you know, yeah, we make mistakes, but overall we're great, you know, we bring democracy and freedom and all that's bullshit. It's supremacism. And when you believe you're better than other people, it allows you to do things which can be completely criminal and yet you justify it. Because, you know, well, for the greater good, and sometimes you have to do things that you don't agree with, but, you know, for the greater good, blah, 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 blah. 
the ends justify the means, blah, 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 blah. And we both, in my opinion, also have another thing in common, and that is we are like sheep being led to slaughter. Because those who are running the world don't give a shit about Jewish people or the American people. And, and some, especially the, the, the real anti-Jews, the, the, the real ones who hate Jews and all that, the so-called anti-Semites, which is a ridiculous term, a perversion of language, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, you know, the, the Jewish people have, have been benefiting from this system. We've been benefiting from this system. And we are both being led down a path which is purely self-destructive. And the writing is well on the wall. You know, if you can't see this, you know, well, I don't know, everybody in this audience probably sees it to one degree or another, but, you know, we are, unfortunately, as a species, very crisis-driven. It appears as if we need a crisis before we start to really do something meaningful. And it doesn't seem very wise to me. We are being led down a path which is our own undoing. And I don't have any doubt whatsoever that the American nation, the people of this nation, are going to be living like a third world nation, uh, big time, especially once one very simple thing changes, and that's the petrodollar system. Everything that you're enjoying right now, it was slightly different before 1973, but everything that we're enjoying right now is, is based on a perverse system known as the petrodollar system tied into the central banks and so on and so forth. And that system isn't going to be around much longer. I'm telling you, when, when oil is no longer traded exclusively in dollars, Everything that, you know, as bad as it is now, boy, oh boy, is it going to get really bad. Especially when that first domino falls and the rest of the world says, fuck America, you know, we've been dealing with their shit for a long time. And you name a country that hasn't been dealing with this shit, we've got bases practically in every nation of the world, you know. And people have been sucking this shit system, force-fed to them by America. And I tell you, the sympathy and the love and all these things that, that people had for America, having lived outside of America for many years now, you know, it ain't there. So people ain't going to be crying extra tears for America when it descends into chaos. And where do you think the bastards who are running this world are going to be? Do you think they're going to be, you know, living amongst the population suffering? Of course not. If you ask me, there's a saying, you know, every empire falls, you know, every... If you ask me, actually, I don't believe any of them actually fell. The people within those empires that benefited from that imperial system, yeah, they fall, they have a real problem, but if you ask me, those who are actually running the imperial system, they just morph into something else. So, you know, it was the British Empire before us. What's the difference, really, between the British Empire and the American Empire? I mean, it's all basically the same thing. It really is. And so America can be sacrificed because those bastards who are running this system, they have control of the things that matter for them to be able to morph into something else. And there's tons of, tons of research and evidence and documents that make clear what we're seeing in the Middle East right now. You know, this is not an accident. This, what's happening in the Middle East is not like, oh, that's really unfortunate, you know, I mean, wow, it seems like a failed policy. It's not failed policy. It's very well intentional. And if we wanted to pay attention to things that are in the public record, we, we would know that. And if we cared about other people as much as we should care about other people, as if they were our brothers and sisters, we wouldn't have allowed this shit to happen. But we have. And now we, we are confronting a situation in which everything that, that we become used to, you know, the kind of comfort level that we're used to. I had somebody say the other night, you know, you're making me really uncomfortable. Good. Good. If you came here to be comfortable, then I hope to disappoint you, you know. I think comfort is part of our problem. The more comfortable we are, it's, it's amazing how directly proportionate comfort is to stupidity or willful ignorance. Some of the dumbest people on the planet are Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, Stanford graduates, willfully ignorant because they know enough to know that if they speak the truth about a number of subjects, it ain't good for their career. So they remain willfully ignorant, although they're completely capable of understanding these things. And in the circles that they are in, which are essential, really, like academia, like, shouldn't we, you know, this fucking place up here, for Christ's sake, should be a hotbed of serious debate, you know, and real conversations about real issues without censorship and whatnot. And, I mean, that place is just pretty much completely controlled, is it not? I mean, there is, there is some free thinking going on, but it's in the external areas. It's not like rewarded. It should be rewarded in a university like that. 
you know, there should be students in that university who are coming here as part of critical thinking and philosophy and whatnot, uh, challenging their views with professors who see, yeah, that's a great opportunity. We've got it. You know, that's not happening. It's not happening because it's all about programming and academia and politics and corporate life and banking and the whole lot, all of it, controlled. And and we, as a population, as the people of the West. Are, are really, we're actually being sacrificed right now. You see what's going on in Europe. This is all engineered. You know, this refugee thing, which is legitimate, of course. You know, you've got people who are fleeing a horrendous environment. Nobody in their right mind would stay in a place like Syria or Libya or Iraq or any of these places that we've devastated. Would you stay there, you know, out of principle? For Christ's sake, especially if you had children, what are you going to do? You're going to get the hell out of there. But all of this is engineered, and of course, you know, they're, they're, they're engineering this wave of refugees into Europe, and, you know, so it's like you have to take one of two positions, you know, the liberal, lefty, humanitarian view of let's take them all in, and, you know, that's the only way, and then the right wing, which is blaming and scapegoating the, the immigrants and the Muslims and all this kind of stuff, and it's like, is there no other place for us to, to really occupy? Do we have to choose these controlled paradigms? Do we have to choose these things? It's like the Democrat Republican. I mean, are you kidding me? Why is that con still going? Why does anybody in their right mind seriously believe that any of the candidates on the left or the right that have an actual chance of becoming president, that are, they're actually going to do something of any significance? And I know I must be offending quite a few people in this room, but I cannot believe that anybody in their right mind seriously thinks that any of those that actually have a chance of winning, if you're talking about somebody obscure who's not got a chance in hell of getting in, yeah, I don't doubt there's integrity and honor within those spaces, but they're not going to be there. And these assholes that they're propping up in front of us, whether they be Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter. You know, and, and the latest one is so obvious with Obama. Like, why? Why did why are people waiting for a savior on a white horse? This is ridiculous. You know, it's mind control. The irony of the life that we're living is that while we attribute so much power to the powers that be, at least those of us who have any clue whatsoever, the fact is that they have no power but that which we've given them. Literally. They have nothing. An example of that, a recent example of that, is uh, Syria just a few years back. Uh, you may recall in 2013, it was like Iraq 2.0. I mean, it was, just, oh my God, are you kidding me, man? They're rehashing the same shit. Okay, here we go. We've got this, this really violated population in Syria. They've got this brutal dictator, and oh my God, it just pains us so much, these poor Syrian people. Boy, oh boy, do we have to help them. And this man, this crazy man who's just oppressing all these Syrian people, he's got chemical weapons, and boy, oh boy, that's just really the, the line that has to be drawn, the red line, as it were, and we're just going to have to help this population if it comes down to the use of chemical weapons. It was so ridiculously transparent from the very beginning, and nobody in their right mind would believe it. And, and the funny thing is, as much as most of you, I bet, will have adopted the view that nobody cares or there's so many, nobody, you know, the masses, they just, they're so preoccupied with bullshit and whatnot. The fact is that in 2013, with all the same kind of propaganda, all the psychological tactics and manipulations and techniques that got a reasonable amount of people to buy into the need to invade Iraq, they were using all the same techniques with Syria. And you know what? Basically, nobody bought it. Nobody bought it. This is really more important than people realize. There was no major protests. Let's go back to 2003, the biggest protests in the history of the world. You know, the thing is that while we had these very large protests, there was still a considerable amount of the population that bought the bullshit. You know, what that number was, well, you know, that's debatable. It might have been. 30, 40, 50, maybe even 60 or 70. Who knows what it truly was? Uh, you know, all the polls and everything said it was sort of 50-50 kind of thing, but I don't really know, to be honest. But they had enough. They had enough. They had enough of us that bought into it to some degree, and that's all they need. 
But with Syria in 2013, with all the same techniques, all the same motivation, all the same bullshit, nobody bought it. The polls, the official polls here said there was about 9% approval with all of that. In this country, you know, as dumb and brainwashed and manipulated as this population might be, basically nobody bought it. And the same thing held true in Europe and England. Same thing. Same thing. And if you're observing like I'm observing, seeing it's clear what their agenda is, Syria was always a stepping stone to Iran. Always a stepping stone to Iran. You know, once we get Syria, bam, now we can, we can head to Iran. And, and these bastards have been attempting this for many years. I mean, post 9-11, there was a huge, huge investment in, in vilifying Iran and attempting to justify some sort of attack on Iran, a provocation with Iran. Huge amounts of effort put into this. And, and it, it didn't happen, and, and they put massive effort into it in 2013. And they even carried out a false flag. Our guys carried out a false flag again. We killed about a thousand people. We killed about a thousand because these bastards work for us. I don't care what, you know, we may use proxies and intermediaries to funnel money, but the explosives and all of the wherewithal, the protection from the media, the political cover, all that bullshit comes from us. And these motherfuckers went there and they used chemical weapons in Ghouta and killed about a thousand people, <laughs> women and children. And even with that, nobody bought it. It's kind of funny, the backstory of that, by the way, if you don't know, because Bashar al-Assad could see this coming, too. He's not a stupid man. I mean, you know, whatever you want to say about the guy, he's not stupid. You know, he's you know, English uh, university degreed optometrist. He actually was probably a reluctant inheritor of the power. It wasn't supposed to be him. It was supposed to be his brother. By all accounts, I, I believe that story. I don't think he was somebody who craved this power, but it was put upon him, and he has done a job, which in that region, if we're to be fair about what it takes to be a leader in that region, it, it was done about as honorably as you could possibly do it. You couldn't do it as a nice guy who respects everyone's human rights and like due process of law, and I'm not making excuses, but the bottom line is, if you're like Mr. Nice Guy and lets everyone do what they want to do and don't have serious surveillance of the population and find out the, the problems, the infiltrators from the enemy, who will use every means to get inside and, and totally destroy you from the inside, you know, you're not going to last. And that's why guys like Saddam Hussein can be our best friend and ally one day, because they'll do whatever the hell it takes. And then tomorrow, you know, they're incarnation of, of you know, they're the Antichrist uh, when it's no longer favorable. But Shah al-Assad saw what was coming and was inviting UN inspectors in for about six months. He was, you know, he was, he was trying to get, you know, Get, come on in, you know, you, you're apparently concerned about me using chemical weapons. Come on in, collect the evidence, and uh, make a report. And he had been inviting them for about six months, and they finally got there. You know when they got there? <laughs> I mean, you could hardly make this up. We have like two days before he apparently launched a chemical attack within 10 miles of where the inspectors he'd just been inviting for six months, they arrive, and he decides to go ahead and launch a chemical attack in Ghouta, 10 miles away from where the inspectors were. I mean, you could hardly make this shit up. It's, it's a bad B movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis and Sylvester Stallone surely are gonna jump out any moment and save the fucking day. It's, it's an alternate reality. And nobody bought it. So the point I'm actually making here is that contrary to what you've been programmed to believe, many of you at least, we have the power. And I tell you what they need from us, complicity. That's what they need from us. And as long as we're complicit, they can do whatever the hell it is they want. But they have to con us into that. It's like the vampire. The vampire cannot come into your home unless you invite him. So the vampire will try and trick you. Because once he gets in your home, you're screwed. But he cannot come into your home unless you invite him in. So. How do we invite the vampire into our world, into our existence, into our reality? With our complicity. When we withhold that complicity, they have nothing at all. Nothing. And Syria is such a stark example. But you know what their response to that was? And you have to give them credit, I have to say. You have to give the motherfuckers credit, man. I tell you, they come up with some good shit. They created ISIS. Well, 
it's pretty good, man, pretty, pretty good. Rehash, rebrand that whole Al-Qaeda thing, and that's all it is. It's a rebranding of the same bullshit, and it's so transparent and obvious, and in the immediate, they got quite a bit of traction. They have, but I think ISIS, Israeli Secret Intelligence Service, I think ISIS is, is the same thing as 9-11. In the immediate, there was amazing success. The, the, everything they had planned out, the goal of full spectrum dominance, you know, permanent military bases in, in, the, uh, in the region of the Middle East, uh, securing Afghanistan, I mean, that didn't, all, none of it went perfectly to plan, but all of the objectives that they were seeking from this new Pearl Harbor event laid out in the Project for a New American Centuries document Rebuilding America's Defenses, also another one, A Clean Break. All of the shit that they had written about, which it seems as if they have a policy of revealing everything they intend to do, but unfortunately there's such a minority of us following this stuff that they, they seem to have provided us with notice. Here's what we're going to do. Does anybody have an objection? Nobody. Okay, excellent. So we shall go ahead and carry out an agenda of full spectrum dominance and start invading people and wars of aggression and killing people in mass and torture and all that shit. And, but we said we were going to do it, didn't we? But nobody objected. And that's what they got from 9-11. They actually achieved the goals. For the most part, they achieved everything they were looking for. And the same thing with ISIS. But on the back end, on the back end is something really remarkable. In 2001, how many people knew what a false flag was? Think about it. How many people knew what a false flag was? This is a tactic they've used throughout history for millennia. It's not just recent. I mean, it's something that's been used for millennia. And it's very effective. In fact, it is the most effective tactic for manipulating people into war. And you have to understand, if you're trying to understand the world, one thing you have to do is if you are even halfway sane and human being, you need to get out of that perspective, okay? You know, just remove yourself from any kind of sanity or humanity. Like, get out of that space. The space you need to get into is the space of a psychopath and a sociopath. No empathy whatsoever, completely drunk on power, willing to do anything and everything to elevate yourself and your position of power. That is the kind of mental space you need to get into if you want to understand the way things work. And if you look at it that way, you have to understand that those who are effectively running the world primarily through the financial system, that's what they are. They're psychopaths, sociopaths. Many of them are pedophiles, if not all of them. And many of them are involved in things as nasty and sadistic and untouchable as things like fucking little boys and little girls before they sacrifice them. These are things that are happening. And the evidence to support this kind of stuff is overwhelming. And if you really want to go into a rabbit hole, Go ahead and start exploring that stuff, because I'll tell you what, it's there. And this is the kind of thing that these people do, if they're even people, for that matter. I really don't even know. I mean, if they actually are human beings, they've lost all their humanity. So in that sense, they're not people. They are not human beings. These individuals do not give a shit, and they will do anything. And what they're experiencing right now is very troubling. Very troubling indeed, because what we are experiencing right now at this point in history is a rising of the human consciousness that's never, never happened in recorded history. We don't know of any period in human history where so many people are becoming more and more aware, recapturing the ability to think for themselves and actually becoming human beings. And one of the basic attributes of being a human being, especially as a parent, is concern for your children. And while you may feel that you have the strength and ability to deal with the kind of draconian bullshit that is being thrust upon us, such as mandatory vaccines, well, I think that's great, excellent, good stuff. Bring on the mandatory vaccines and all that kind of shit, because if that's not going to engage people, I don't know what is. No, you have to inject your children with fucking poison. And if you don't, we're going to throw you in jail. Good, excellent. Get a taste of what it is for much of the world who are dealing with things not only like that, but worse than that. The Palestinians are a good place to go. Put yourself in the place of a Palestinian. That mandatory vaccine shit is a day at Disneyland compared to what they're dealing with. So I'm happy for us in the West in our comfortable little space to start to explore discomfort on a real level and experience real injustice to the point where your children are being ordered. You're being ordered to poison your children. 
we are experiencing a rising of the consciousness of humanity that is so profound and so unparalleled that it is scaring the shit out of the powers that be. And to be honest, they know damn well they're living on borrowed time. Literally, they're living on borrowed time. And what they need, and what they've always loved anyway, is war. War is good from the psychopath, sociopathic, pedophile, corrupt, nasty, drunk on their own power perspective. War is fucking beautiful. It's wonderful, man. It's like an orgy of, uh, you know, sexual, orgasmic, you know, kind of pleasure for them. Because as a tyrant, a tiny group of individuals, a club, a tiny little club, less than 1%, in order for a tiny percent of the population to control the masses, you will need a couple of things. One of them they violated big time, but the first thing is division. You must keep the people divided. Because contrary, whenever I hear people say human nature, I always cringe, it always, I know it's, it's gonna be some negative shit about human beings. And I think what people seriously do not pay attention to or acknowledge is that We've lived in a world now for thousands of years that rewards corrupt behavior. We're not rewarding honor and integrity and wisdom. Give me a position. Show me somebody who is being rewarded within the system itself who actually exhibits real honor, real integrity, real wisdom, real courage. Does the system reward people like that? Hell no. It punishes people like that. Hell, in most parts of the world, they exterminate people like that. The system knows very well. They understand psychological profiles very well. The fact that I'm still standing here, uh, to me, is an indication of either I've got some angels, you know, flying around protecting me, God, divine intervention, or I'm, I guess, about as lucky as it gets. It seems like, from my experience, the only thing that has protected me has been something beyond my control. Because when you do the types of things that I do, and many others, Paul Arruti, another really good man who I've, I've experienced some really incredible stuff with. I mean, I know there's other people in here too, put it on the line. You know, we're, we're, we're taken out, you know. We, we're marginalized, a lot of us are beaten down. Uh, you know, we, we, we really, we, we're kind of a rare breed. There's no reward for this. And people know from a young age you know, you want to you wanna progress and, you know, make money and live a good life. You know, there are just certain things you're, you're not going to, you know, deal with because it's a much easier path. Let's go this way. It's a lot less obstacles there. Great quote, you know, and I took the path less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Well, I've taken that path that's less traveled by. And it is an amazing journey. And, and if you're if you don't have a lot of strength, I'm sure it, it, it can be an amazingly difficult uh, journey and one that beats a lot of people down. We live in a world that has rewarded immoral, psychopathic, sociopathic behavior for millennia. So when people talk about human nature, what they're not factoring in is that we're not actually living a natural, healthy existence at all. We're living in a collective state of insanity in which literally we threaten our own existence. Like in the movie V for Vendetta, we're hardly any better, if any better, than a virus. A virus, you know, infects the host, acts as a parasite, basically will spread, and if the body doesn't have the strength to actually quell the virus, the virus will take over the host to the point that it will kill the host, and the virus is killed as well. And isn't that what we're doing right now with our behavior? I mean, here we are with these big brains, these very expensive anatomical pieces of uh, uh, equipment that require a lot of oxygen, blood flow in order to keep it maintained, and yet, with this big brain of ours, we're actually no fucking better than a virus in what we're doing, literally. This is a very sorry state of affairs. But still, even with that, there are so many of us that are growing in awareness, and again, the powers that be are aware of this and they're shitting themselves. And the reason why they are carrying out the policies they are is because really the best bet they've got is a third world war. 
if I were them, that's what I'd that's what I would do, man. I mean, really, you need a third world war, man. You need some big enemy to unite the nation, stupefy the people with their false bullshit fake patriotism while their constitution's being flushed down the toilet, rah, rah, wave the fucking flag, and go invade another nation. I mean, it's beyond ridiculous. And they need something like that. It's always worked, so they're counting on that. And they're trying on every level. You know, this madness in the Middle East... This, this picking a fight with Russia, what? Why are we picking a fight with Russia? First off, the Russians will kick our fucking asses. They are tough, real tough, not fake boy man fucking fake hero shit. They are tough motherfuckers, big time. And they will kick our ass if we got into a fair fight. They don't back down the Russians. <laughs> They're not like Iraq with no weapons to defend themselves or all the other nations that we pick on who never have the ability to fight back in any substantial way. The Russians are tough and they're nuclear armed and they are not going to bow to anyone. And we're picking a fight with them. These assholes who we call our leaders are picking a fight with a nuclear armed Russia. Why would they do that? Yeah, on purpose. It's not an accident. I hate it when you, even on Russia Today and Press TV, you hear these experts, these political uh, opinion makers, talking about things like, you hear these phrases about like, oh, it seems like, it seems like the American government never learns, and uh, Obama's policy is a repeat of the failed policies of the Bush regime, and it's not a failed policy. There are a bunch of prostitutes who follow the order, read the script. An actor is perfect, Ronald Reagan, that's why he's one of the most popular President's ever, he was an actor. He did a great, really great job at it. The less you can think, you know, the better. You don't need a thinking president. Generally, you have a thinking vice president as a conduit to the president. We see that on more than one level. But the bottom line is, this system is intentionally milking uh, a third world war. And we see this on every level. Same thing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, <laughs> yeah. You know, well, uh, the Israelis, we've been sold on decades now that they, they want peace, but they don't have a partner in peace. And, you know, these, this, this, this nation of loving Jewish people who's been more victimized than everybody else, whose suffering is supreme to everyone else, they just don't have a partner in peace. But this is so ridiculous. From, from pre-1948 Israel straight through to this day, this monstrosity of a nation, the ultimate criminal state, the so-called Jewish state of Israel, look at the policies. I mean, people, you can say whatever you want, but what are you doing? And to say that these people want peace while carrying out these policies is ridiculous. Why do we pay any lip service to what we're being told? It is absurd, completely absurd. They don't want peace. There is no interest in peace. Those who are running the world, who own our governments and these prostitutes that we supposedly vote for, these assholes are following a script, and the script is we need another war. And it's never-ending war, as it should be if bankers are running the world, because nothing is better than, for them than war, because nothing divides people more than war. So that's what we have. And as long as this system is in place, none of that is going to change. But isn't that part of the optimism we should have? Because actually, while we're all doing our own thing, because we all have our causes, don't we, myself included, we all have our causes, and we're all kind of fighting in our own corner, you know, usually operating with pennies, and we're trying to affect good, whatever our subject is, fracking, you know, uh, anti-imperialism, you know, chemtrails, or, you know, the reptilians, or the Jesuits, or the Illuminati, or, you know, the fear porn, all the shit that's out there. We're all like fighting all these different things and ignoring the one thing which we can't talk about, can we? We can't talk about it. We can't use certain words. Language has been manipulated. Political correctness is the order of the day. And people like me are supposed to be vilified because apparently I'm, to put the correct term, anti-Semitic is ridiculous. My ex-wife is Semitic. My children are Semitic. The people who are using this word don't even apparently know what Semitic means. The people that they're saying that I'm against are actually Ashkenazi Jews, to be more correct, not the Sephardic Jews who actually are Semitic and who come from that region. But the people that I'm apparently against 
uh, aren't even Semitic. <laughs> they don't come from that region. They don't even speak Hebrew, which is a Semitic language. The, the Ashkenazi Jews come from another part of the world altogether, you know, the Caspian Basin and Eastern uh, Europe and beyond and whatnot. Uh, they speak Yiddish. I mean, that's their language. It's not Hebrew, and they're not Semitic. And I can't be anti-Semitic unless you want to use a perverse definition of the word. What they really mean to say is anti-Jewish, don't they? They mean to say that I'm anti-Jewish. So let's talk about what, is it, what it is to be Jewish, which, of course, we're not supposed to talk about. You know, I'm anti-supremacism, big time. If you feel... I'm as anti-supremacism with, uh, with Jewish people as I am with the American people and, and anybody else who adopts this kind of thinking. If you believe that you're better than everyone else or your group is better than everyone else, that's, that's already problematic in itself. But when you combine that supremacist ideology with incredible power, now it becomes a real problem, a big problem, one that I believe we should not ignore, one that we have to address. So in the case of America, well, we all know America's might. I mean, unless you're brain dead, we all know how America's browbeat and bullied everyone around the world into submission. We've got our military bases all over the fucking place. And, you know, we have no amicable relations with any other nation. We're just a big bully, a classic bully. No one ever really respected us over the last several decades. They feared us and did what they had to do. And the ones that stood up to us generally were killed or imprisoned, you know, this is the way it is. But within, within this context, we have a, a situation in which this supremacist ideology is taking us to the, to the brink of, of complete self-destruction. And my problem with Judaism is based on my anti-supremacist uh, perspective. If you are a Jew, who believes that everyone is a brother and sister, if you find as a Jew it offensive that a nation called Israel happens to be calling itself the Jewish state and you are speaking out against it in an honest way because let's get into infiltration and controlled opposition and controlling the narrative and here we get into where it's not all black and white it's not as clear as you would think because so many within the groups right here in Berkeley in particular are completely controlled opposition and their job is to make sure that the Palestinian so-called Palestinian solidarity movement doesn't offend Jewish sensitivities and trust me if you haven't experienced this firsthand that is the agenda you can do whatever you want but you cannot offend Jews no matter how true it might be for instance the Jewish state it's not the Zionist state by the way it's the Jewish state the Jewish state enjoys massive massive support within Israel and still to this day although the numbers are dwindling in terms of Jewish support Israel still enjoys significant majority support around the world from the Jewish diaspora this is not seriously debatable and I'm not going to question that more and more Jews are genuinely disturbed by what they see because effectively they have abandoned the idea of Jewish supremacism those that are sincere see this Jewish supremacist criminal state with no extraditions around the world that's involved in organ trafficking, blood diamonds, selling nuclear technology to apartheid South Africa, committing an open policy of genocide, and I say genocide by the legal definition of the word Black's Law Dictionary, to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, or religious group. By that definition, the policy of Israel is inherently genocidal and it's clear in places like Gaza that the intent is to make things so unlivable that people just leave. But God loved the Palestinians, man. They just keep having kids. They, they refuse to leave, and it appears as if they can endure anything. Their love of their land and their nation is such that they will not bow. They are going to continue. You're going to need to use nukes to wipe them all out, and that's the truth about what we see in the Jewish supremacist state of Israel, which largely adheres to Talmudic Judaism and boy oh boy let's get into some religious texts that are as as obscene as you can imagine and those who don't understand or think that the power structure within Israel is operating largely within Talmudic dictates are naive you are naive these influential uh, religious 
documents are, in fact, the highest order within Judaism amongst those who are in power today. It's not the Old Testament, the Torah. It's not. It's the Talmud. And in the Talmud, you'll find some amazing stuff. And this is the brand of supremacism that the Palestinians have been dealing with, and we haven't been allowed to say the word Jew and not talk about Jewish supremacism. And I'll tell you what, that's why the Palestinians have been sucking on it for decades, because we've bowed and refused to actually say what needs to be said and be honest about what is really happening here. The fact is that we have the same qualities here in America. It's expressed in a slightly different way, but in terms of actual impact around the world, we dwarf what Israel does. I mean, what they do is obscene, but it's dwarfed by us and what we do with our brand of American supremacism. So the scorn that I have for Israel and Jewish supremacism actually takes a backseat to the American supremacism that I was born into and in fact served as a US Marine. I have major problems with the way we've been carrying ourselves. I believe that we as Americans, see I can say this and let's see how offended people get. I believe that we as Americans are collectively responsible for the actions of our nation. That is my perspective. And I also believe that the Jewish people collectively are responsible for the actions of the so-called Jewish state. Now I'm sure that really touched a nerve with a lot of you because you've been conditioned Oh, but not all Jews feel that. Do you, when I said Americans are collectively responsible for the actions of America, for the, for the historical reality of America, did any of you, maybe all Americans don't feel that way. It's a lesser, it's a lesser. And if you're to be honest, you had a knee-jerk reaction just with that statement saying, oh, but not all Jews feel that. I know that. Why would anybody in their right mind suggest that every Jew feels this way? It's absurd. And yet we're programmed to have to say that and qualify that. Oh, the Zionist Jews, they're not the Jews. And, you know, wait a sec, let's get into the Talmud. These are Jewish people who believe in things like Jesus Christ is boiling in hot excrement in hell. That's in the Talmud. I'm not making that up. Mary is a whore. Mary is a whore. And a Jewish man, and there, there's like so many things that you can get into. If this shit was in the Quran, <laughs> Oh my God, oh my God. If this was in the Quran, a Jewish man can have sex with a three-year-old goy, non-Jew. Rape a three-year-old girl, completely approved from the highest levels in the Talmud. C cannot have sex with a two-year-old, sorry. Can't have a one or two-year-old, gotta wait till they're three. Sorry about that. This is in the Talmud. And this is the authoritative document for the Jewish supremacists who are running a country which has been destroying the lives of Palestinians for decades, hardly with a whisper. Not only have the Arab and Muslim brothers and sisters in that region largely turned their back on the Palestinian people, but we've been financing the oppression of these people ever since Israel was created, in fact, even before. And the reason why this continues is because we can't speak honestly. Political correctness, and control of the dialogue is the reason why we have not solved this issue sooner. And we've all played into it to one degree or another, and it's why I refuse to play into that game. Because I'll tell you what, if a Muslim got up and said what I'm saying, he'd be done by now. He'd be, you know, in prison, killed, whatever. He'd be done. You know, but we white folk, you know, especially as middle class white folk from suburban shit, we can say a whole bunch of stuff that they can't. And we need to say it. <laughs> We need to say it. We need to control the dialogue. We should not be bowing to political correctness in any way. And if we continue down that path, we're going to find ourselves getting nowhere. But if we're going to have an honest dialogue and really, really get serious about growing as a people, as a nation, religiously, spiritually, then we need to start discussing these uncomfortable things. I could get into vegetarianism. There's another one. I tell you what, as, as uh, taboo as uh, religion is, I tell you what, food and what you eat, boy, oh boy, we can get really offensive there. And I figured this out recently. You know, the reason why food subjects are so taboo is because in this very fucked up world of ours, in this collective insanity, with no real meaningful way to fulfill our true humanitarian 
expressions, we have one thing that we love and we can always count on, and that's food. And now, you motherfucker, you want to take away some of my favorite foods from me and tell me some of the realities of what I'm eating and how that's destructive to me, to the planet, and for any serious spiritual growth. There are so many subjects that we don't have any real dialogue about, and isn't that where we should be discussing things? Isn't it those most uncomfortable areas that we should be looking at? Isn't that really the mark of a genuine critical thinker, someone who really wants to grow as a human being, morally, spiritually? It's the uncomfortable areas that are the most important. And these gatherings oftentimes are just like preaching to the choir. And everybody patting themselves on the back about how, oh boy, aren't you progressive? And wow, isn't he just so liberal and left and righteous and all this kind of stuff? And I just don't understand that because, you know what, I've got two little boys as well. And before I was a father, I had a problem with this. But how can we look at ourselves in the mirror and genuinely have any respect for what we see looking back at us if we're handing this world over to our children just in the current state, much less something worse than it is now? We had children just so we could hand it over to them like that? Well, that's pretty disgraceful, man. And that's the reality. That, that's the thing that we're, we're actually confronting. But with all of the kind of doom and gloom and all the kind of pessimism that, that people can adopt, there are so many reasons to be optimistic. I've already mentioned the, the, the growth in human consciousness. There's actually one thing. If you, you know, I find like there's so many things that people discuss that fits into the fascinating category. Like there's a big category for fascinating but not actually that relevant in terms of affecting a better world. So is it the Illuminati or the Jesuits or the Reptilians or the Bilderbergs or, you know, whoever? It's all very fascinating, I have to say, very fascinating. The thing is that they're using an instrument, whoever it is, they're using one instrument above all others to actually affect their control. Money. Money. It's that simple. Money makes the world go round. And what we have is a tiny group of individuals who literally control the vast majority of currencies around the world. They effectively own the Bank of International Settlements, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Central Bank, uh, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve Bank, all the major central banks. They own There's a tiny clique. We don't even know who the shareholders of the private Federal Reserve Bank are, but we do. We do. But we don't officially know. Because if we knew who the shareholders were, we'd know who's profited by the interest that we pay, which is totally unnecessary, on every single dollar that is coming into circulation. A group of private shareholders is getting the money for that. A tiny group of people, who knows a few board members, is actually earning the interest off the money that we have allowed our treasonous government to authorize to a bunch of traders who print the money. They use money. And they have an infinite supply of money. Think about that seriously. Infinite. Infinite. Endless budget. Imagine having an endless budget. Imagine that. I've worked with pennies trying to change this world and realize, fuck, hey, man, it's not possible. You've got to have at least some money. And trying to find somebody who can outspend you a billion to one uh, is tough. In fact, it's pretty much damn near impossible. Not quite but nearly. The money supply is the thing that runs the world. What this tiny group of psychopaths and sociopaths, pedophiles and otherwise completely corrupt, immoral, lacking in empathy people is they have an infinite supply of money. And with that money they have bought everything and every one that can be bought. So when you talk about human nature, what you're talking about is a millennia-long history of those who have no morals, who are generally pretty clever, not always, not always, George Bush, you know, you know whatever, uh, whoever. They have no morals. They are oftentimes not very clever, but many times they are extremely clever, but lacking in any kind of empathy. And there's also other ways to make sure you have the kind of tight-knit control, which is actually pretty admirable. Because how many people can we name in any of these structures of power who've spoken out at high levels? I mean, the, the biggest, most stark example 
of somebody at a high level who actually spoke out. You know, there are other exceptions. There's another man in this room, Scott Bennett. Does anybody know who Scott Bennett is? Okay, there you go. But you, who, who knows where Julian, who knows who Julian Assange is? Right. Who knows who Edward Snowden is? Yeah, right. You should know about that man over there. That man is a real whistleblower. He's got balls that are bigger than, you know, most basketballs, I'd say. And, and he's ultimately, nobody really, no, well, people do, but, you know, we should all know who this man is. This man has the, the goods to prove that Hillary Clinton and Swiss banks directly finance what, finance what we know as ISIS, and yet you don't know this man, you know. So people who are compromised, uh, you know, false uh, opposition, controlled opposition, generally you'll hear their names. Like National Public Radio. Not once have I been invited on there. I mean, you know, whether you like me or not, I mean, why wouldn't you invite me on? Come on, challenge me on my shit. Come on, let's go. I can turn off the swear words and all that stuff. No problem, let's go. No, not once. So even the ones that you admire, you think, you know, are really open-minded and really pushing the dialogue and open debate and all that, bullshit. Bullshit. You know, the real people who are actually doing real honorable stuff, usually you won't even hear of them, and they don't get rewarded. The ones who have no morals, those are the ones who get rewarded. That's the world we've lived in, and it all comes back to the financial system. These individuals have an infinite supply of money. They bought everything and everyone. The world we live in is a reflection of that reality. Take that power away. By the way, I didn't get to the last historical figure who was like high up and, you know, who actually did something. That'd be John F. Kennedy. That was the last president who actually had some integrity. Uh, even though he was a servant to the rich most of his life, you know, that something happened to him. I'm sure it was the Cuban Missile Crisis. He realized by following the dictates of these bastards, uh, he brought us to the brink of the end of the world, and that was too much for him. That was too much. He, he stopped obeying the orders. He went directly against the orders on many levels, especially with the issuance of United States notes that bypassed the Federal Reserve Bank. But aside from that, yeah. That was a ballsy move. At least we Americans have one president who actually had some integrity. <laughs> At least one, for God's sake, because the rest of them, you know, what a bunch of criminals. The whole lot of them, left, right, Democrat, Republican, doesn't mean a damn thing. A bunch of criminals, none of them with any integrity. I don't care whatever bullshit policy they carried out that had some benefit. It was always just a ploy, part of a big game. None of them actually gave a shit about the American people. And this is the way the world functions. But in this very twisted reality of ours where literally all of the top levels of academia, the media, I mean, the media is most definitely, I mean, that's a critical tool for them. There's no question about that. But it's the banking that makes the control of the media possible. Uh, the police, the courts, you know, everything. You name it. Any, what's that? Masonry, yeah. But if you're like a 20th degree mason, pff, you don't mean anything. You know, you got to be like 30 one thirty two thirty third degree mason for it to be anything it's it's a good it's a good move for a businessman to, to become a mason you know it's great for networking it, you know, a lot of business opportunities and you're not actually involved in anything of any real significance at the lower levels it's only at the high levels if you're willing to go that far you know and the whole system weeds out anybody with empathy so by the time you get up to that level yeah you may have done enough to prove that you have the value for us to take you up to that high level. But most of the Freemasons are, you know, whatever. They're not bad people at all. But the Freemasons at the top levels, yes. They're sadistic bastards at the, of the highest order. Um, any, any kind of aspect of human society you can name of any relevance to the control of human existence is completely controlled, almost without any exception, by those who are running the world through the financial system. This pattern uh, reveals itself all the time. I've been involved in, in initiating some really powerful uh, actions. The Human Shield action to Iraq was extremely powerful. I mean, I could give a whole lecture about that. Um, this was scaring. I know, I know from Susan Lindauer, who was inside the circles in the White House at the time, spoke with Scooter Libby and Dick Cheney and all this stuff. She told me personally, like, they knew damn well about Human Shields, and they were very concerned about it. They knew damn well that it could tip uh, the scales in the favor of the people of the world who are against this war, 
and it could have potentially stopped the war. But here I had this you know, very powerful thing that I initiated, which got an amazing traction around the world and had huge potential. I was literally operating with pennies. I'm serious. I mean, I, I was, I was like trying to fundraise for a couple of buses to, to leave from London to, uh, to Baghdad, and, and I was scraping pennies together. Hell, the night before we left London, I was actually on one of our double-decker buses that I managed to get the money to buy, putting the, the vinyl lettering and shit on it, while most of the human shields that I had recruited to come on this journey were out fucking partying and saying goodbye. I was on the damn bus. I had an interview with, I don't know, BBC or some shit at like 6 in the morning. I was out all night in the rain and cold in February putting vinyl lettering on the bus. That's how much money I had, because trust me, I wouldn't be fucking doing that myself if we would have had enough money to pay someone to put that shit on there. And we had something that was incredibly powerful, had the potential to tip the scales in our favor, stop this horrible invasion and occupation, but it didn't work, because what did, what did they do? They infiltrated it. Volunteers? Yeah, oh, I'll volunteer, I'll help you out. Sure thing, I'm here to help. And these volunteers, they come in and they actually do help. They do good work. Who in here is working for intelligence services? In a room like this, there is definitely a few of you in here. Yeah? Are you really working for an intelligence service? Yes. So, out of this room, if you don't know the statistics, there are several of you. And you're working for intelligence services. And not one of you rose your hand seriously because you're fucking liars. You're a liar for a living. You get inside of good groups with people who want to affect a better world and your job is to fucking lie and pretend to be something that you're not. Shame on you, cowardly fuck, whoever you are. And I don't know who you are and I wish I could prove it, but I can't. The fact is that they use their money to infiltrate us and they subvert from the inside and it's done over and over and over again. And there's so many different methods of carrying this out and it's highly effective. The enemy inside the gate is much more dangerous than the one outside the gate. I can assure you of that. This country is a living example of that. The enemies are in fucking Congress and the White House. These sycophantic, disgusting traitors who have eviscerated the U.S. Constitution who bend over and literally take it where the sun don't shine when Netanyahu comes here for the third time. <laughs> Embarrassing. All of this comes from the financial system. All of it. The problem for the Jewish people is that that system is completely dominated, almost totally controlled by Jewish bankers. And, and this explains a lot about how we understand history because of all the things that Adolf Hitler, oh boy, here come, oh my God, did he say Adolf Hitler and Jew? Oh my God. Oh my God. And so, so what we know about Adolf Hitler is like what we know about history. The victors, of course, write the history, don't they? They write the history, and they tell us a narrative, and we're supposed to swallow that bullshit as if it's true. The major crime of Adolf Hitler was that he got out, he got Germany out of a banking debt that was drowning the German people, drowning the German people in a cesspool of moral decay, drowning in debt. And he had the nerve to actually say fuck off to the bankers and start printing their own money and Germany went from a destitute post-World War country that was drowning, Germans starving, no jobs, nothing and he got them out of that debt and literally brought that nation back to a powerhouse within several years just by using their own money supply. That's the real crime that Adolf Hitler committed. Now I could sit here and talk and really excite the senses a little bit more about everything we've been taught about World War II and the Holocaust, but let us suffice to say that it fits in line with virtually everything we've been told about history in general. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> the beauty of this system is that it is very, very fragile because it relies on this one thing. And without that one thing, it is powerless, impotent. It cannot do a damn thing. And John F. Kennedy had the courage and the balls and integrity to bypass the Federal Reserve Bank, to bypass this financial system, and he was dead 
within six months. And there ain't no coincidence there. Definitely not. We only need to do one thing to turn it all around. One thing. Let's confront that financial system. Let us print our own money. Let us throw out all of these motherfuckers running around as our so-called representatives who have put their hand up under oath and swore to uphold the U.S. Constitution. These traitors should be thrown in prison, literally. And I'm waiting for the so-called American patriots to do your fucking job. Do your job. You swore to uphold the U.S. Constitution and these traitors are running around carrying out the orders of a foreign entity and using your American sons and daughters as cannon fodder for wars for Israel. And that is what we've been doing. And we've reached a point now where we've got 22 American service members a day minimum committing suicide because we were sent off to fight a war for Israel in which the Israeli leadership had identified target number one as Saddam Hussein. And I have no love for Saddam, that son of a bitch that we use as an attack dog to punish the Iranians when they had the nerve to throw out our fucking puppet, the Shah. I have no love for Saddam Hussein, but let us make no mistake at all. It was infinitely better in Iraq under Saddam Hussein than it is post-invasion occupation of American policy. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq when Saddam Hussein was there. Look at it now. A cesspool of these motherfuckers that work for us. They work for us. CIA trained, funded, coddled, and protected the whole way through. Always worked for us. And now Iraq, after our control, is a cesspool of these son of a bitch, mercenary, fake Muslim motherfuckers who work for us. That's Iraq today. And the kind of suffering that is happening in this nation is incalculable. Do you know in Fallujah, do you know that in Fallujah, the doctors of Fallujah advise the population, the women, not to have babies? You know why? Because the amount of toxic, radioactive, experimental weaponry we used in that area is such that the degree of birth defects is so high that it is actually advised not to have babies. If that isn't a patent crime against humanity, I don't know what is, and I'll tell you what, I'll use the word again, Jewish power is what put us there in the first place. It was the Jewish state of Israel that dictated we take out Saddam Hussein at all costs, just as we're doing in Syria right now because he fits the same bill, another Arab leader who refuses to bow before Jewish power and American imperialism and anyone who refuses to do that at that level must be punished and we will destroy your whole country and send in foreign mercenaries who will chop off your heads and commit any atrocity in our name in order to carry out that policy and that is the reality of what we're experiencing all of this stuff is a matter of public record if you don't know Odid Yanan's a, a strategy for Israel in the 1980s you need to read it you need to read it how many of you know what the Samson option is? Yeah, yeah. the Samson option. Let me, let me paraphrase it for you. The Samson option is, and this has been endorsed at the highest levels within the so-called Jewish state, is a policy which is not dissimilar from American policy, by the way, because we Americans have an official policy of first strike capability. We reserve the right to use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear stakes in a free, in a first strike capacity. We've basically threatened the whole world and said, listen, if we feel you're a bit too problematic, we reserve the right to fucking nuke you. Even if you're totally defenseless, that is our official policy. Literally. Well, the Jewish state has an even better one. If we feel that our existence is threatened, we're going to fucking nuke all of you. We're going to take you all out. That's the Samson option. 200 to 400 nuclear weapons in the so-called Jewish state. Now, very nicely, thanks to the Germans and your bullshit fake history and your fucking guilt, you've now given the Israelis nuclear-armed, effectively, dolphin-class subs, which they've now armed with nukes, which now can patrol the oceans of the world and deliver those nukes to any target. At, with a nation that is openly committing a policy of genocide, which is also openly threatened to exterminate the world if it feels its existence is threatened. And by the way, if you agree with Henry Kissinger and the CIA, as I do, 
I like saying that. All right. <laughs> I'm still a little disappointed, damn it. Didn't you not call for reinforcements? I really want them. I want to, come on, man, seriously, with all the resources, I expect something more, but maybe the next venue. By the way, I'm going to be in Ashland next, then I'll be in Portland, I'll be in Salem, I'll be in Seattle, I'll be in Spokane, so uh, pass it on. So we have an extremely dangerous situation, you know. America is already openly threatened anyone who uh, we perceive to be problematic for us. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say what I agree with, with Henry Kissinger. Did I? I forgot to mention that. Yes, I agree with Henry Kissinger and the CIA, who both say that Israel will be no more. Henry Kissinger said within 10 years, a couple years back, a few years back. CIA said, I think, within 20 years, uh, several years back. Um, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I see the so-called Jewish state of Israel as I see the apartheid regime in the dying days of its existence. The apartheid regime enjoyed all of the same favor that we find with the modern state of Israel. Uh, it was very famously Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan who were calling uh, Nelson Mandela a terrorist and were openly supporting trading and providing all the things required for the apartheid state to continue. While, by the way, I repeat, the Jewish state of Israel was selling nuclear technology to the apartheid regime. Yeah, did I make that up? So Israel is, in my opinion, that's where they are. Israel as a state especially when we look at the reality. I mean, for me, it's like old hat. Are we seriously going to get into just serious debate about the, the different laws for Palestinians? I mean, apartheid is a very generous word to use for what the Palestinians are dealing with. Even Bishop Desmond Tutu made clear that the brand of apartheid they experienced in South Africa paled in comparison to what the Palestinians are dealing with. And for a much longer time, the Jewish state is only able to operate in the dark. This is why the dialogue has to be controlled. This is why it needs a, a media, which happens to also be Jewish controlled, very, very disproportionately. We know about Hollywood, which creates the myths which we follow. This is all completely Jewish dominated. There's no question of this. Many of them don't call themselves Zionists, but it is Jewish controlled any way you cut it. And, and these, these institutions are required for Israel to remain in the dark and to be able to play itself off as this peace-loving nation that doesn't have a partner in peace. That narrative has been allowed to continue because of this structure of power. And this is exactly why, of course, I'm not allowed to discuss it. We're not allowed to say the word Jew. Find out who you can't criticize, and there you'll find who is in control. The fact that people come to these events to try and disrupt it and tell us that we can't use these words should be a real incentive and motivation to be more committed to speak the truth regardless of the consequence and not censor ourselves. And the truth of the matter is that we have an Israeli state which is in its dying days. So the real question is, is it going to carry out the Samson option? That's an interesting question. Are they going to carry that threat through? You know, if, if JFK had had his way, Domona, the nuclear power plant in Israel, would have been inspected way back in the 60s. We've heard a lot about Iranian power plants being inspected because they're a ridiculous, mythical nuclear weapons program, which has no credible evidence behind it. But... We, we would have had 200 to 400 less nuclear weapons had it been for JFK. If he had been allowed to live, that plant would have been inspected and it wouldn't have been able to produce nuclear weapons. APAC, <laughs> Jewish power, Mersheimer, Walton Mersheimer. You know, this, uh, this monstrosity we know as APAC with this incredible level of power, actually Kennedy was going to shut that down too because the precursor to APAC was... The, Jew, the American Zionist Council. And Kennedy was insisting on having that uh, re registered as a foreign agent. I've actually read the dialogue. It's quite fascinating between the Kennedy administration and the Jewish leaders of the time who were arguing that the American Zionist Council cannot be registered as a foreign agent. And basically they used all these lawyer tactics to delay and delay and, you know, technicality and delay and delay. And you know what? They delayed it and delayed it. I think it was over the course of a couple of years. And they finally got to like the last stage where they really like, that's it now. We've played this game for a long time and now you're finally going to have to pay the piper. Kennedy happened to die within that month. He was dead. Kind of coincidental if you ask me. 
The consequences of the assassination of JFK could hardly be any more stark. Hell, he was replaced by this insanely disgusting, sloven traitor, a man named as Lyndon Johnson, who was also the one at the top of the pyramid who covered for another atrocity committed by Israel, the attack on the USS Liberty. Here's our best friend and ally in the Middle East attacking an unarmed ship not far off where the Mavi Marmara was, by the way, where we were attacked and the Israelis again attacked a defenseless ship and murdered and executed people on a humanitarian aid mission. We were attacked very close to where the USS Liberty was attacked, funny enough. And you know, what was the lesson learned there? Israel can do anything, man. We can attack you in broad daylight. We can have you know, hundreds of witnesses, crew members who witnessed the whole thing. People uh, will be threatened and silenced, and it doesn't matter. Israel can just say, oh, we're sorry. You know, oh, we made a mistake. And we, our treasonous leaders will cover for that shit to this day. And the lesson is you can do whatever you want. And this is the lesson. You know, there is nothing but impunity in this world. Nothing. Those who are in power can do anything and everything, and they get away with it. They even abduct, torture, have sex with, and sacrificial, you know, ritual sac sacrifice uh, young children. I mean, anything. It, it all goes. This is the world we're living in. But it can change and will change. Would we like to hear about the Mavi Marmara bed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll just give you a little tidbit, right? This is one of those examples of where I must have some guardian angels or divine intervention because the things that happened on that ship were truly remarkable. I've looked at the ballistics reports for, I did a story, a documentary about it actually, and I've looked at the ballistics reports for those that were killed. Of the nine that were killed, there's actually a tenth man. Another man was in a coma for several years and he succumbed to those. So there's actually ten people that were murdered by Israel. Six of them provably were executed. The ballistics reports make that clear. Point blank range shots, kill shots, usually to the back, back of the head. And in the case of one American boy named Firkin Doan, uh, the kill shot was right here, just underneath the right eye, point-blank range, tattooing on the skin, proving that it was at point-blank range. Um, Israel did all that and, and got away with it. But here's a funny little tidbit. There was a point in that experience where I was involved in disarming two Israeli commandos. And without getting into the details, one of the disarmings where I actually took a 9 millimeter pistol off of one of these Israeli commandos was filmed by a press TV uh, a press TV reporter. He actually filmed it. And he, he only told me about it later. Um, and of course he did everything he could to get that footage out. Now if that footage had made it out, oh my god, what a hero I'd be fucking. I tell you what, man, fucking video of me taking a 9 millimeter pistol off of an Israeli commando who could be one of the murderers of these other people would make me a hero like nothing. You know, I'm thinking, in a way I'm grateful because it's bullshit anyway. Heroes are not the answer. And a hero is an infantile version of a warrior. A warrior is not a hero. Let's not confuse the two. And anyway, the Israelis have that footage. They, they took that footage. So they have footage of me disarming one of their commandos, which probably doesn't win me any favor. I was already not very favorable in the first place, but you can, I can you know, rest assured they don't like that shit at all. And that's why after they released us uh, a couple days after, I actually was refusing to leave. I actually totally refused to leave. In fact, they emptied out the prison that we were in, and there was just two of us left, two Irish people, funny enough. Hundreds of people left the prison they had purposely built for us, and we were refusing to go. You bastards kidnapped us. You fucking killed our fellow passengers. We never asked to come to Israel. You fucking brought us here, and now you have the nerve to fucking deport us from a country we never asked to come to. And all based on the bullshit fucking lie that this was a security threat to your fucking fourth largest military in the world and all this bullshit. A ship that had no weapons, purely uh, humanitarian. This was the reality, and I refused to go. Anyway, you know, this man, actually, this is a great story. This man here is in the room, Paul Rudy. Again, I'll mention him. He was actually, we, we all were in Ben Gurion a Airport. Um, we were finally, they were, they were sending us off, and we, there was, I don't know, 20, 30 of us, something like that, sitting there. And here comes Paul. He's got like a black eye and he's got bruises all over his body. He's tattered, he's got blood on him and all this kind of shit. And they're like grabbing Paul and he's screaming in pain. And we all got up and started shouting. And uh, the Israelis, you know, they, they didn't like that very much that we were protesting this. 
And one thing led to another, and, you know, we got into a scuffle with the Israelis. I got whacked over the head. If you've seen the pictures online, you know, blood, that's, that's how that happened. And, you know, one of the Turkish guys got a leg and an arm broken. You know, they were, like, beating the shit out of us. Put me in a chokehold, and I couldn't breathe for, for quite a while. And I have to give the Israeli some credit. He did let go, because that was the one time I thought, shit, man, I might not make it here. I mean, he fully had me in a chokehold. I could not breathe. And anyway, you know, we, we got into that altercation. Eventually, everybody was shipped out because I had this blood all over me and whatnot. They, they had to leave me. They couldn't send me off like that. And I ended up spending a couple more days, you know, got beat up again. Nothing really, nothing to bitch about. It's nothing compared to what the Palestinians endure. So let's put it in perspective. And, and then they, they let me go. I was like the last guy to leave, if I'm not mistaken, who wasn't seriously injured. The only ones that were left were in hospital, like, and they couldn't actually transport them at that point. So I was like the last guy, or certainly one of the very last ones, to be deported to, uh, to Turkey, Istanbul. Two days after I got there, a friend of mine, Quiva, Quiva Butterly, uh, she was on the phone with somebody, and they were saying, what? And she was like, what? And she handed me the phone, and it was Al Jazeera. And Al Jazeera's like, what is your response to the accusation of the Israelis? I said, well, what's the accusation? They, said, they say, well, you're a, quote, operative of the Hamas terrorist organization and that you were traveling to Gaza, you were traveling to Gaza to, quote, form and train a commando unit for Hamas. So you dipshits just had me for a fucking week. I was refusing to leave. And two days after, you let me go, oh, shit, he's a fucking terrorist for Hamas. And, and, and they released this ridiculous information and, and you know who takes it seriously? Because I've traveled the world. You know which nations take this shit seriously? Well, we're sitting in one right here. In fact, that's why the TSA, that's the whole fuck the TSA. By the way, ah, fuck you, TSA. Fuck you, Homeland Security as well. That's why they wanted to stick me in their little radiation box. Which, by the way, the body scanner, is a perfect little picture of every contour of my body. Every last bit of it, every fucking last bit of you, if you step in that damn thing. So that's just slightly problematic for me from a privacy standpoint. But aside from that, guess what? Pregnant women and children aren't allowed in those machines. Why do you reckon that is? I mean, if it's all that safe, what's the problem? Why not send toddlers through? Fuck, I just had a baby. Can I put him in the fucking scanner as well? If it ain't good for pregnant women and children, uh, I don't see how it's good for me. But aside from that, uh, it's just offensive. It's really offensive. And by the way, guess who controls the fucking security at airports that were implicated in 9-11? Let's get into that. Israeli-controlled security. So these assholes who fucking run the show, who are supposed to be providing security to us, are checking on me because I'm a, quote, operative of the Hamas terrorist organization. And then I have to go step into the radiation chamber in order to be checked because, of course... While I'm a very clever guy, I also have got a, an asshole, and I might have some shit up there, and it won't be revealed without that fucking detector. I mean, it is beyond absurd. And this is the country we live in. And every time I got stopped, I would opt out. But they've apparently changed the rules now that a high-security risk guy like me, an operative of Hamas, no less, actually has to step into the machine. And that was my red line. And that's why, actually, this is like the last tour some of you will be very happy. I will be leaving this country. I actually intend not to return to the USSA. And ultimately, uh, I'm doing so because, you know, that's it for me now. But before I go, a big fuck you to these treasonous motherfuckers who are running this place. Uh, but you know what? It's, it's just unacceptable. It's unacceptable. So I'm honored to be labeled a terrorist by Israel. And I mean that in all sincerity. And I'm honored to be labeled an anti-Semite by the Anti-Defamation League, an organization set up to defame people. How fucking Orwellianly perfect is that? The Anti-Defamation League. The whole fucking point of the ADL is to defame people with the brush of anti-Semitism. That's the whole point of it. So I'm honored, <laughs> quite frankly. Thank you very, very much. I will accept that as a badge of honor. So getting into the good news, yeah? Are we ready, ready for some good news, I think? Hopefully. My concern has been a better world. For real. For real. And I've thought for years and years, what can be done? What can be done 
to seriously affect a better world. I mean, really, honestly, meditated on it, thought about it, and really tried to figure out what is the best thing that I can do as an individual to contribute to the creation of a better world, something that is sane, something that I can feel good about handing to my children and to everyone else's children. And years and years of reflection, one thing that I came up with very early was, you know, these, this tat these tattoos on my hands, world citizen. I realized at a certain point, I looked at what it is to be a citizen, and I realized that a citizen is, has been entered into a social contract. We're in a contract with the state. And under that contract of citizenship, we have so-called rights, <laughs> at least in theory we have some rights, and we have obligations. Among the obligations is following these laws, which apparently includes those treasonous laws that are completely contrary to the U.S. Constitution, but apparently we have to follow that. That's a part of the obligations. We have to pay taxes. Technically, we're not supposed to have to pay taxes according to the U.S. Constitution, but you'll probably go bankrupt trying to defend yourself exercising that right. We have obligations. And I realized I don't agree to the contract. That's why I renounced my citizenship. And I realize, you know, most people aren't going to do that. I mean, you know, it's, it's a pretty serious move. And it wasn't lost on me how serious it was. But I felt like I needed to do it. Probably a lot of that was due to being an idiot Marine who signed up to be a fucking strong arm tool for imperialism, you know. I, I didn't know that at the time. Only later did I realize that I was nothing but a pawn in a nefarious game. Yeah, Smedley Butler, War is a Racket. Incredible book. There's a real Marine for you. And, and I realized, you know what? I'm not really American as much as I'm a human being. And I don't really come from this thing, these lines that are drawn in, in North America, otherwise known as the United States, as much as I come from planet Earth. And actually, every human being on this planet is a brother or sister. And I don't give my allegiance to any individual group, religion, nationality. In fact, every single human being, in my opinion, deserves my respect. And I shall treat every other human being as I myself would wish to be treated. It's sanity, it's basic, and everyone can understand it. And that's what I mean. That's what I mean by world citizen. So, affecting a better world. A lot of times when you talk about, you know, what do we need, what do we need? A lot of times what, do you, what you'll hear people say is, we need to unite. We need to unite. Well, it's easy to say that, but how many things can we actually unite under? I mean, you name me a topic, name it. <laughs> you know, I don't care what it is. If you're rescuing orphans from pedophilia, you're going to have a debate about why that's not the correct thing to do. I mean, it's just about that extreme, literally. I don't care what your issue is. It's polarized, purposely so. We are being manipulated and engineered to have differences on every level so that we can't unite. This was one of the major problems with the so-called Occupy movement, is that you had the so-called 99% who were putting forward ideas that were not in any way agreeable to the 99%. Not at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, and a lot of really kind of out there lefty ideals and principles, no matter how virtuous or unknown they, they really are, you know, if you want to unite people, then you cannot be putting forward something which is highly divisive and polarizing. That's not going to unite people. So at the core of the plan that I've developed, which years ago I could have announced this plan. I, I, you know, I had the opportunity to do so, but I honestly felt that the timing wasn't right. One of the things I've learned over the years is that no matter how good your idea is, no matter how much it has to offer, if the timing ain't right, it doesn't fucking matter. You're not going to achieve it. Timing is everything, as they say. And it was only in December of last year that I felt the time is now. The time is now. And the reason why I came to that conclusion is because the one thing that I've developed over the years is I've become a really abs astute observer of humanity. The consciousness, the, the knowledge, and the understanding of humanity. And it was through this observation over many years that I have witnessed a transformation which verifies for me and I think to those of us who are truly watching verifies the rising of this consciousness it has changed drastically back in 2001 September 2001 was the height of insanity 
and f sympathy for an imperial nation that had been running roughshod over the world for decades, centuries in many ways, certainly decades, and this incredible sympathy for a nation that was just being set up to carry out these offensive policies, all based on a false flag. Nobody knew what a false flag was then. And as I said earlier, so many people know now that whenever a potential false flag is carried out, there are literally thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, if not even more, dissecting every last detail of it. I believe we've reached a point where the false flags are actually good in terms of recruiting more people into the category of conscientious. Not to dismiss the hardship, suffering, and pain of those who were taken out as a result of these false flags, because no one can diminish that. And, you know, of course, as a human being, I feel great sorrow for people who lose their loved ones in this. But in terms of the impact, these false flags kill a few Westerners as opposed to, what, a million to two million that we murdered in Iraq? Never even so much as apologized. So let's get out of our own asses a little bit and start putting things in perspective. If it takes a few Westerners or even a lot of Westerners to be slaughtered in order for us to actually start to re do with, deal with the reality, good, because we need to do that. We need to do that. We've reached a point now where the false flag, the number one tactic to manipulate people has been so exposed that it's largely become irrelevant or counterproductive. That's a massive development, massive, massive, massive. And there's so many other things. In this state, you find the power of unity in you know, you know, marijuana has been something that, like, the powers that be, they've been totally committed to not allowing this to be used at all for many different reasons. Hemp as well, incredible part of the solution. Marijuana, amazing plant with so many, so many qualities. But it shows our priorities. We are so committed to this, this thing that we have a self-interest in. We want to be able to use marijuana. We, we like it. And therefore, we're willing to put a lot of energy into it. And when we put our mind to something, it shows what we can achieve, despite all of the instruments of power put in place to prevent us from being able to use this plant, this herb, we're now able to use it in a very open way. That's another indication of the kind of power we have once we commit ourselves to something. And that's just a small, that's not even, a, you know, the overall population. It's just a well-organized minority who really insisted and mobilized and organized and educated and bam, you know, despite all the instruments of power that would have prevented that, we've achieved it. Well, we could achieve anything we set our minds to. And if you have a product that has the capacity to appeal to people across the spectrum on a planet with seven billion, well now, you've got some real power there. So, at the core of this plan, this World Citizen Plan, there's a whole lot to it, and yet it's very narrow and very focused. Anyone can understand it. And yet I've not revealed the strategy, and the reason why it's, you know, the basic excuse for me not doing this is it's like, you know, announcing to your opponent in a boxing match what you're going to do. I mean, you know, you don't tell your opponent, I'm going to come in first with a left jab and then a right underhook and another left jab and then a right overhand. You, know, you don't do that. You don't tell your enemy, your opponent, what you're going to do. It's just stupid. And I've already experienced, as I spoke about the Human Shield action to Iraq, and I've also was involved in another thing that actually had a lot of power and good for, for Palestine's trade, not aid, Aloha Palestine. Both of them were destroyed by infiltration and subversion. And I had no real money to work with, so I, I, I vowed I would not do that again. Now I've got a budget. We did a crowdfunding campaign. I didn't even explain the actual strategy, only some basic principles of it. And we raised over 100 grand in less than you know, two months. Um, I only initiated this in December. I decided to do it. We launched crowdfunding within uh, three weeks. That was successful within 45 days, and we're now in the implementation phase. And the way this is going to work is the, the detailed plan is going to be revealed in one of two uh, circumstances. One, I'm killed or I'm imprisoned. I've already made detailed videos about what it is. So if they kill me, well, from the grave, I'm going to be delivering to you what I believe is a viable solution for us to get out of this fucking mess that we're in right now. And I hope that it works, but at the same time, I'm not attached to it because I realize I can only do my best. The other way that it will be delivered is if uh, we do all the work that needs to be done in order for it to be packaged and presented the most compelling way possible with the resources and logistical uh, resources in place to be able to deal with what hopefully will come. 
And at the core of this plan, I'm not going to get into other details, but believe me, there's other elements. There's a lot of layers of strategy to this plan, again, years and years of developing it because I have this goal of a better world. So at the core of it is an agreement amongst human beings. There's no middleman. It's a social contract. It's a new social contract. As opposed to the contract that you were entered into at birth, where you were issued a birth certificate, all capital letters, a fictitious corporate entity was created, and you basically, and your straw man were created, and you've been answering for your straw man, and this is all the kind of stuff that nobody's going to take the time to understand, so therefore, I've always recognized that if it requires a ton of energy and time to understand, it's not going to appeal. People are already being manipulated and exploited to such a degree that they're not going to make the time to learn the Uniform Commercial Code and like all of this shit, legalese. You need something simple, very, very simple. But we have been entered into a contract that is inherently injurious to our rights. The social contract of world citizenship has three things, just three things. And they're completely unobjectionable from any sane perspe perspective. So in a, in a very funny way, in an ironic way, and I, lo I love it, I get a chuckle out of this reality, it's completely unoffensive. So let me see if it's offensive to anybody here. Raise your hand if you find any one of these things, uh, three things offensive. The first element of becoming a world citizen is, in this case, I'm a man. Yeah, you may be a woman, but I'm a man. And I affirm my natural rights. I have the right to live my life with dignity. I have the right to travel. I have the right to freedom of expression. Hell, I've got the right to clean drinking water. I have the right to be a human being. Without oppressive forces compelling me to be something that I'm not, this is my natural right, and I'm going to affirm that in writing. That's number one. Anybody object to that? The state will, I'll tell you that fucking much. They're going to object to that. Number two. I, as a world citizen in writing, obligate myself to respect Everyone else's natural rights. I don't want it done to me, so I'm not going to do it to you. It's the golden rule. It's the most simple thing ever. If you don't understand this rule, something's wrong with you. This is such a basic thing. And it bypasses the state. So, I affirm my natural rights and I obligate myself to respect for everyone else's natural rights. And the third thing, I come from planet Earth. They call this place the United States now, but, you know, after we're gone, it'll be fucking what it is, planet Earth. We come from planet Earth. And what's good for planet Earth is good for us. Shitting on planet Earth is not good for us. It causes us problems. We should be treating planet Earth like we should be treating our mother, with love and respect. So that's the third. How many people out of seven billion do you think, if this is delivered properly? And the beauty of this plan is that it's so simple that it will be made into all of the major languages. So this isn't going to be just for a Western audience or an American audience. This is for the world. This is for the people of the world. How many people around the world do you reckon will see the value in entering into a new contract in which we all agree to respect each other and this planet? Now, I don't know what the numbers are. I really don't. But I'll tell you, if it's 1%, that's enough. You know, 1% of 7 billion is enough. We have 7 billion plus of us on this planet. Do you think there might be 10 million who feel that way out of 7 billion? Maybe 100 million. Maybe a billion. Maybe even more. I don't know. But I'm going to do my best to put that forward because I think this is a good agreement. I think we would all benefit from this very sane, very logical approach to life. No longer shall we take the view that we need to give up our freedom in order to enjoy this fake security that we'll never get from this inherently corrupt, violent system. Just three things. Everyone can understand this plan in 15 minutes or less. Hell, if I do my job correctly, it won't take you more than five minutes. And the question is, do you understand one thing? You're the answer. We are the answer. What we decide to do, we will make a reality. And all that power we gave to these son of a bitches who are running the world, we can take that power right back. We can bypass the state and make an agreement with each other. 
which is beneficial to every one of us. Unless you happen to be at that top percent and you're benefiting from the destruction of human values, human life, if you profit from war, okay, well, this may not be the thing for you. But thankfully, you are well in the minority because the rest of us are sucking on this shit situation and we're all struggling to be able to make ends meet. And the same son of a bitches who are running the world have the audacity. This is cute. They have the audacity to tell us all, you've all been fucking sitting on your ass too much. You know, you've been living high on the hog. We need to pull on the purse strings. You owe money. Who do we owe the money to? Isn't that a valuable question? Who the hell do we owe this money to? Did we not just bail out the bankers to the tune of trillions a few years back? But, but we still owe money, do we? And to who? Well, that would be those that you're not supposed to criticize now, isn't it? That's who controls the money system. And these son of a bitches, they want more of your money. They've got everything. It's not even about the money for them. They want power. They don't want you to have any disposable income or any disposable time to be able to do what you need to do to be a fully-fledged human being, to really express yourself, to be free, to feel a certain level of pride and dignity about yourself. Because in this world, in order for you to truly respect yourself, you have to confront in your own way, not my way, but your way. You have to confront the reality. You have to be honest with yourself and be honest with the world and the people you share this planet with. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all, but this plan is going to make it about as easy as possible. And the key to its success is not how good I am, but it's how much we want it. And I will do my best to pull a little bit of a Jedi trick to get people to realize we have the power. We can do whatever we set our minds to. We don't have to give these son of a bitches our power and allow them to destroy the world right before our eyes to destroy our children's future. We can make a better world, and we can start with this very simple three agreements. The highest social contract of all, as opposed to the social contract that you were entered into at birth as a little baby, you were put into a contract of which you could never possibly have been informed about because you were a baby. You couldn't even understand your native language at that point, but not only were you not informed of it, but you were entered into something that has an effect on you. We can create a contract which has an effect on them a real effect on them. We can enter into a contract that is as revolutionary as it gets and yet it's totally unobjectionable. This contract is a spit in the fucking face of power. Every oppressive thing that you're dealing with right now stems from our lack of achieving this very simple three-step process. Every offense being committed against you, the financial terrorism of the tax man and the IRS, the parking fucking ticket you get, the bullshit you deal with in your local community and your local government, the national government, the federal government, all of that bullshit is actually a violation of your natural rights. It fucking well is. And we can take that back right now. We can say, you know what, I'm not doing that. If the numbers come, and this is where strategy and everything comes into it, if the numbers come, we're going to have a big budget. With that budget, we're going to be paying a considerable amount of money to some honest and good international attorneys who will be defending the position of those world citizens who are best qualified to represent this. People who have made enough money to be deemed taxable, but who are going to stand up, not on their own, with the backing of the millions of world citizens if this is, a, if this is to be successful. And the argument is going to be that I cannot be compelled to pay tax when I can prove beyond any reasonable doubt that a portion of that tax is being used to commit the worst crimes possible against fellow human beings, specifically wars of aggression, which, if you believe the narrative of the Nuremberg Principles, was, in fact, the greatest crime. All of the crimes of war stem from the war of aggression, the initiation of war in an aggressive way. That's why Hitler is, you know, so hated and whatnot, apparently, because he invaded Poland. He had much more claim to Poland than we do for invading Iraq or Afghanistan or any number of places. But apparently, this was the greatest crime ever committed, and we're doing it. And we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that our taxes are going to pay for that shit. So while we may chant slogans and hold up placards that say, not in our name, bullshit, in our fucking name, paid for by us. This 
we can say no more no more morally I cannot continue supporting this financial bullshit and lawfully I've also entered into a contract and unlike that contract you entered me into at birth of which I could not be informed and certainly could not provide consent I am a thinking man or woman I have of clear conscience entered into this contract because I see it as beneficial not only to me but to humanity as a whole and also to this planet so if you want to claim that your contract that you entered me into at birth which inherently strips me of my natural rights is the highest law of the land good let's confront that reality our job according to the state is to finance the worst crimes imaginable and you have no choice the position of the state is doesn't matter whether you entered into a lawful contract or not you don't have the right to refuse to pay for mass murder we tell you what you can do and we order you to do it and if you don't do it we'll throw you in jail or we'll fucking kill you we'll threaten you we'll do all the things that we can do because your job is to pay for this shit that's happening over here I look forward to finding out how many of us are finally gonna say uh-uh not doing that anymore not anymore we have the power So I believe on that note, you know, uh, there is more to it, and uh, I promise you there'll be bang for the buck uh, when it is uh, really presented in full. But I honestly believe that this year, 2016, boy, oh boy, is this a big year. This is a big, big, big year. We have an opportunity to prevent the worst case scenario, and this time is a great honor, really. As tumultuous as it is, wow. What a time to be alive. I firmly believe that this generation, the here and now, we are going to define the future of life on planet Earth, including our children. It's up to us. And if you hold the cynical point of view, please know that the tyrant loves you more than anything else. The tyrant needs you. The tyrant needs you to believe that you cannot change this world, that you're only one person, that it's always been this way, it'll always be that way. They need you to believe that because if you don't believe that you can have a better world, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. But if you believe and you can see a better world, and I can see it, literally. Right now it's upside down, and it will be flipped right side up, and you will not recognize the world when it's flipped right side up. I'll tell you what, man. Wow. Is that going to blow your mind? We're actually going to have people in positions of public trust who represent our true will. Honorable people with integrity and wisdom. Imagine that. Imagine having a government with people of honor and integrity and wisdom who truly represent you well. Imagine that. We've just come to accept that that's not possible, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? And that's one of the greatest achievements of all. They've got us to accept this shit. Unacceptable. In a word, unfucking acceptable We can change all of that. It's up to us. 2016. Let's make it happen. Check. Thank you.